Hello, good afternoon. We're just waiting for some more attendees. Um, so please bear with me for a moment. Thank you for those who already um, have zoomed in. Um, we're just waiting for a few more attendees and then I make a start. Okay, why don't I make a start? So, my name is Fabian Freinhagen. I'm a professor in philosophy at the University of Essex. I'm also the director of the MA in philosophy. And today I just want to tell you a little bit about um, the program at Essex, but also um, I will give you a little mini research talk and then we can discuss that. We can, you know, I can ask me questions about the program here at Essex, but also I'm happy to uh, address any general issues you have about, about uh, studying uh, postgraduate degrees in philosophy, whether at Essex or elsewhere, and also how to apply to it. I know that sometimes people just want to know how this works, and I'm happy to advise on, on all these matters. So, but I start with telling you a little bit about the MA program here at Essex, um, and then uh, give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of teaching we do here, and then we can get to any questions. You have. Okay, so I think one thing which is important about when you think about philosophy at Essex, um, especially at MA level, we approach things in a problem driven and ecumenical way. What I mean with that is that we start with practical problems in our lives, um, in our personal lives, but it might also be in our political, social lives more broadly really problems which raise existential issues about what it is to live well, what kind of form of government we have or should have. And we take these problems from everyday life and then draw on a wide range of thinkers and research tradition to address these problems and to help our students think um, about these problems and address them. So we're really focusing on problems, real world problems if you like, and then we try to take every trick in the book to try to think hard about them and how we can think about them differently and make progress with them. So let me give you just one example. Obviously one of the major issues of our time is the ecological crisis and the climate emergency. Um, for example, um, as it's been highlighted by this political movement of Extinction Rebellion. And responding to these um, pressing issues and this political movement, we have put on a module uh, on environmental philosophy, which is taught by my colleague, Dr. Alice Vasmund. Um, and she's really starting from these contemporary concerns of the ecological crisis and trying to bring various philosophical resources uh, to bear on them and help um, the students who take this module uh, to think about it in a fresh way um, and to really grapple with the existential issues it raises. Alice herself is coming from an ancient uh, philosophy perspective, but she really brings a whole tradition of philosophy, temporary resources to bear on this so important issue. Just to give you another flavor of the other modules we will be putting on next uh, academic year, and you could take here. Fiona Hughes will be teaching um, the philosophy of Kant, 
for graduate students as well as for undergraduate students. Um, she is one of the leading Kant scholars, uh, including work like this book here on Kant's aesthetic epistemology. She will teach the first critique, Kant's critique of pure reason, but she's always interested in how that relates to wider issues, particularly in phenomenology. She works also on Merleau-Ponty and in aesthetics. Then we will have uh, Marie Guillaume, Dr. Marie Guillaume, also another colleague of mine, teach a philosophy of language course. She is really trained in philosophy of language and philosophy of herself, but um, the course will also bring in issues from feminism, um, uh, questions about bullshit, what is saying bullshit, having bullshit conversation, what does that do to our practices, linguistic practices, and uh, wider issues around prejudice and so on. So she's using resources of philosophy of language, but bringing them to bear on contemporary issues and problems of a social and political nature. Um, our very own Dan Watts will teach a module on Kierkegaard. Dan is currently writing a book about Kierkegaard and what it takes to think. So Kierkegaard is one of the major existential thinkers, 19th century thinker, and has been inspiring various other 20th century figures and Dan has been writing and working on Kierkegaard for a long, long time and is currently completing this book on Kierkegaard and what it takes to think. Um, we will have um, two modules on critical theory. One will be taught by my colleague, Dr. Lena Finlayson, who will, I think, pick up issues again in feminism um, and look at them from a sort of perspective of the last 20, 30 years of feminist critical theory. We will have a module on aesthetics and politics, which will be taught by my colleague, Dr. Jörg Schaub, who's really interested in how aesthetics is really fundamental to a lot of uh, political issues and questions and framings. And in particular things that we need a certain kind of aesthetic freedom in order to work as a democracy. And that's what his focus will be on. And I will teach a module on the Frankfurt School, Frankfurt School Critical Theory, by looking in particular at the question of uh, progress, uh, moral progress, whether there is any, and what, if anything, would follow from that. Um, looking at figures from Adorno and Horkheimer, Habermas, Honneth, uh, Rachel Yegi, Amy Allen, um, partly also thinking about issues about decolonialization. So that just gives you a sense of the kind of modules we will put on next year. Um, in addition to these modules focusing on uh, particular issues or thinkers like Kierkegaard or issues like environmental philosophy, we will, we've decided as a department a few years ago that it's really important to support students for this extra step from undergraduate student to postgraduate student. Um, obviously, we foster research skills already in our undergraduate students, but for postgraduate students, this, there is really something more required in terms of being more of your own researcher and more of a contributor to academic debates already. And that takes, takes getting used to. And then we think it's really important to get people a leg up in, in that. And so we put up uh, a dedicated workshop to help you get to the postgraduate level of writing and research from the start. That's an, in addition to the modules and themes and thinkers we put on as an extracurricular activity, and it really helps people because they get very precise and detailed uh, feedback um, on writing and researching um, so that um, from the very beginning, hopefully, uh, people will be best equipped to uh, do well at postgraduate studies, both at LMA and if they continue at PhD level. Students really find this very, very helpful, this um, workshops. And it will be taught by one of our senior academics, Professor Beatrice Hantail. Um, she works on Heidegger and Foucault and Nietzsche, um, and she's taught this module before. She's also working um, together with uh, Dan on a project called The Ethics of Powerlessness, where the idea is that often ethics is sort of for these powerful agents like Superman or something like this, and what they are constrained uh, not to do and what they should aim to do. But in fact, there are various situations in life um, where we are quite powerless or feel at least powerless. Think of end of life situations in the context of COVID, for example. Uh, someone is on one of these oxy oxygen machines. Um, and what are ethical obligations, ethical virtues 
um, ethical behavior in these sort of contexts where we might not be able to change the world, but is there still something we can do uh, to make things ethically better? And that's a project which has been running for a while. Um, and uh, Beatrice would use perhaps material on that project for her workshop. Um, workshops mainly on skills, focus on skills, but we, the best way to learn you know, your skills is by grappling with some of these existential issues has been mentioned. Okay, I have to sort of include a little disclaimer here. This is the provisional teaching allocation. Uh, what I've told you about, it might still change. People might get a grant um, and uh, might be freed up of teaching or, you know, it might, because of COVID, certain things have to be moved around. I can't guarantee you that, but um, can't guarantee you that it will be exactly these uh, people teaching these modules, but we are, planning on that basis. And we're also planning on the basis of returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching in the autumn. Um, so um, both of these are subject to change, but these are our current plans as it stands. Either way, whether it will be online or face-to-face -face, as we very much hope, you will be part of an active research community and you're supervised by world leading experts in the field. That's what we have to offer here at Essex. Just to give you here a flavor of some of our recent work. So I mentioned Beatrice's project on ethics of powerlessness. She's also written on that in various journals and book chapters, including, for example, this piece on hope, powerlessness and agency. Um, another colleague, Professor Irene McMullen, has published recently a book on existential flourishing, really trying to build a view of ethics around these existential problems I've mentioned. We have a second project running in the in Essex philosophy uh, about competition competitiveness by Dr. Professor Timo Jutten. Um, and there will be events and other things associated with that. That's just started in October. Uh, Fiona Hughes is not just working on Kant, but also Mel Ponty, I mentioned. Dan Watts has written on Kirkwood for many years, is working on this book now. Uh, Jörg Schaub has written on aesthetic freedom. And a third project run by Professor Ben Martin is the Essex Autonomy Project. So just to give you a flavor of the kind of publications which our colleagues of mine have published in recent years and the kind of projects we're doing, really existential problems, questions about decision-making, that's the autonomy project, questions about what we do with, for example, end of life situations and when we feel powerless, ethics of powerlessness um, question uh, project. And then also a project on basically markets and issues about competition and competitiveness and when they are good and when they are problematic, competition, competitiveness. So there's a really very vibrant research culture here at Essex and you would partake in that if you do an MA and possibly PhD with us. Now, briefly on my own work, um, among other things, I focus on the early Frankfurt School critical theory, particularly um, Adorno's philosophy on which I uh, offered a monograph. I've also more recently looked a bit more at Horkheimer's work, particularly the book Eclipse of Reason. And I just want to give you a sort of little mini research talk um, just to get your philosophical juices going. Um, and if you want, we can discuss that a bit afterwards. So this book, Eclipse of Reason, is often maligned as being problematic in various ways. And I think it does have its faults. Uh, but I think there's something interesting going on there. Um, so let me start with the objections, if you like. Um, Jürgen Habermas in the mid 80s criticized Horkheimer and also Adorno um, by saying that in a way the theory of modernity is, the critique of modernity is too totalizing. And one can understand that they have this totalizing critique of modernity, Habermas thinks, um, if you think about the, at the time in their writing, for example, the Dialectic of Enlightenment in 1944, 19, yeah, 1942 to roughly 1944. And these were dark hours. So Habermas says, intelligible how, it is intelligible how the impression could indeed get established in the darkest years of the Second World War, that the last sparks of reason were being extinguished from this reality and had left the ruins of a civilization in collapse without any hope. So though Habermas can understand that, you know, if you had in exile in 1942 and look at the world, you might really despair and think uh, reason has left this world and has been extinguished and has disappeared. And we can't even mount a 
criticism of the world anymore on the basis of reason. And then Habermas goes on, but, you know, that was just an impression at a really dark hour, and we have all these resources like communicative rationality, which we can rely on to do social critique. And so this was a dead end where Habermas, um, Habermas thinks this was a dead end where Horkheimer and Adorno ended up. And I'm not so sure. I want to say, Habermas, you're going too fast here. For a start, the book, which he criticizes, is called The Clips of Reason, Reason Not Extinguishing Reason. Now, you might think that's just a pedantic uh, little point, but I think there's something to that, uh, at least as a starting point. Um, so Horkheimer's claim is not that modern reason has been eclipsed, or the reason with which we can modern society has been um, extinguished from the world completely. Rather, what he's saying is that somehow it has been eclipsed. Now, we all know when, um, for example, the moon eclipses the sun in a um, solar eclipse, it's not that the sun suddenly disappears um, for the moment of the eclipse. The sun is still there. <laughs> the, moon, the moon is just blocking our view of it. And in the same way, uh, I think Horkheimer isn't saying that the kind of reason, the kind of rationality with which we can criticize modern society has just disappeared, it's just gone completely. It has only disappeared from view. It's an epistemic point. Um, we can't perhaps see it because it has been eclipsed by this instrumental notion of rationality by which our modern world is so governed. So if it hasn't been extinguished, but just is sort of disappeared from view, how can we resurrect this idea of reason, which is different from instrumental reason? How can we resurrect it? And here I'm currently investigating whether there's perhaps a, a kind of linguistic turn in the early Frankfurt School. So the linguistic turn, people mean roughly speaking, um, a big paradigm shift in philosophy from the mid 20th century onwards, where people were committed to the idea that we can't have access to the world other than through language. And hence that all philosophy to some extent has to reflect on language as a medium by which we get access to the world. And also that this medium, language, we learn intersubjectively. And so intersubjectivity is sort of um, built into our thinking of the world in various ways. Now, Habermas obviously subscribed to the linguistic term. Um, he emphasizes the idea of communicative rationality very much. But Habermas, thinks he's the first in the Frankfurt School Critical Theory tradition who does so. And I want to doubt that. I think that what Horkheimer and to some extent Madonna have to say about language suggests that they have gotten on to the idea um, of this sort of linguistic turn already before Habermas, and he failed to see that. So here's a really sort of suggestive statement by Horkheimer in Eclipse of Reason. He says, language reflects the longing of the oppressed and the plight of nature. Language reflects the longings of the oppressed and the plight of nature. Sort of puzzling, you know, normally if you're sort of a Marxist theorist, how Horkheimer is meant, you know, is trying to be, you would say the ruling ideas of the time are those ideas of the ruling classes with Marx and Engels. And you might also say the language of a particular time will probably more reflect um, the longings of the oppressors than of the oppressed. They oppressors after all control um, how language is used, they control the you know the media and so on. But somehow Hogheimer has this view that language somehow reflects the longings of the oppressed. And not just the longings of the oppressed, but somehow the plight of nature is somehow captured within linguistic structures and language and so on. I think this is puzzling, but it's also rich in uh, interesting to pursue and in my research I've uh, looked a bit more into that and there's for example a very interesting letter Horkheimer writes to Adorno in 1941 where he's trying to think about these issues a bit more and he says a language intends quite independently of the psychological intention of the speaker the universality that has been ascribed to reason alone and now comes the important part when it serves the status quo, when language serves the status quo, language must be therefore, must therefore find that it consistently contradicts itself 
and it serves the status quo, a language must never find and consistently contradicts itself. And this is evident from individual linguistic structures themselves. Again, this is somewhat puzzling what is meant here, but I think it gives us a sort of research program, if you like. Um, if Hockheim is right, then um, defending the social status quo, whenever one defends the social status quo, and if the social status quo is problematic, as Horkheimer thinks the current one um, is, if you defend the status quo, then somehow it must show up in language that, that is somewhat inconsistent, that language somehow is inconsistent in that, that, that somehow the linguistic structures of defenses of a status quo must be strained in some sense. There must be something about these linguistic structures which show that something is amiss. It's a very suggestive, but rather puzzling idea. Now, we find a bit something like that idea um, also in Adorno. Here, I want to just alert you to another passage where he says, the preservation of humanity is inexorably inscribed within the meaning of rationality. To preserve humanity is prescribed within the meaning of rationality. It has as its end, rationality has as its end, a reasonable organization of society. Otherwise, rationality would bring its own movement to an authoritarian standstill. Humanity is organized rationally solely to the extent that it preserves its subject according to their unfettered potentiality. There's something Adorno wants to say in the very meaning of rationality, which links it with the idea of human unfettered potentiality and links it with the idea of the preservation of humanity in these potentialities, not just the survival, mere survival, and links it to the idea that society has to be organized in such a way as to preserve these unfettered potentials. And if society doesn't, in a certain sense, it's irrational. Okay, puzzling, I think. Um, but I think we can make headway with it. And I can't tell you the full story here. But just to make it a little bit more concrete, um, I started off by saying one of our pressing problems of our time is um, the ecological crisis and um, the climate emergency. Now, perhaps what Adorno is saying here is not completely unrelated. Of, well, uh, you know, he couldn't couldn't have known exactly about climate emergency. Uh, he died in 69, 1969, but he had at least a sense for something which might be not unrelated. So when he says this idea that the meaning of rationality is about the preservation of humanity and its unfettered potentiality, and its society is irrational if it doesn't preserve that. And one way one might think about it is that an economic, not economically, an ecologically unsustainable society is in a certain sense a contradiction in terms. If you think about the idea of economy and society, if you really unpack what they mean, then what they ultimately mean is the sustaining of humanity over the long run, in an, basically sustaining humanity into an indefinite future. But if our economy is such that it's unsustainable in the way it operates, then in certain sense, it contradicts the very idea of what we actually mean by society and economy. Now you might say, okay, how does that help us with anything in the world if we make these claims about language, that language has these sort of normative resources about what we actually mean by economy and society, and it's sort of misused when we when we talk about ecologically unsustainable society, something sort of goes wrong there. Well, again, it's a longer story, but the idea here is that debates about sustainability, I think, are often misframed. They're misframed in various ways. But one way in which they're misframed is that there is a sort of contrast often between economy and ecology. And I think even at the level of linguistic meanings, that is a misframing. Because if what I just hinted at with Adorno um, is true, that the very meaning of economy is tied with the very meaning of long-term sustainability, then in some sense, it's not um, an alternative, either ecology or economy. We're misusing the words when we present it as an alternative and say, look, we have to choose between um, economy and ecology um, and they're both weighty matters. It's, that's how often it is presented. 
but in many ways that might be seen as actually a misuse of language where the notion of economy is actually used in a too abridged and too narrow-minded way. Okay, this is lots to take in. I'm just sort of giving you a hint of what my future research might involve. The future research might involve namely taking this idea from Horkheimer that it's evident from individual linguistic structures, such as political speeches, so political speeches are linguistic structures after all, that when language serves the status quo, it must find that it consistently contradicts itself. So I want to find out, is there something to that idea of Horkheimer that it is evident from individual linguistic structures um, that there are these linguistic problems in trying to defend, um, for example, unsustainable, um, ecologically unsustainable economy. Okay, this is really just give you a hint of a sort of problems and uh, resources, problems I'm grappling with and the resources I'm trying to draw on to uh, make headway with it. I'm not proposing that I've answered um, these issues, but it's given you a hint at what the problems um, are, which we here at Essex work on and how we draw on various thinkers from the modern European tradition, but also contemporary debates and analytic philosophy and other things to make some headway with it. Okay, if you want to find out about my, about my own work, um, you can, uh, these, um, there's some links here. I've recently written about acting irrespective of hope. I, I think we don't need to hope for success in order to act. We can have sometimes just act in an expressive manner. Um, and this idea of irrational society and how that's to do with sustainability is also something I touch on in an online lecture you can find easily. Okay, this by way of telling you a little bit about the MA at Essex and by giving you a sort of taster of some of the research issues we're dealing with by teaching you in the MA and inviting you to research on your own as part of the essays and the MA dissertation. If you have any questions about the, the above, just uh, ask them now or send me an email. Um, also, as I said at the beginning, I'm very happy now to talk uh, about anything related to the postgraduate studies in philosophy more generally, how does one apply for that, and so on. So I open the floor now to questions, either in the chat or in the Q&A, um, or just by raising your hand, and then I will take them up. Thank you. Okay. So Anna is asking, will there be opportunities in the MA to study post-Kantian German idealism, most especially Hegel? Um, Yes, there will be. Um, so German idealism, post-Kantian German idealism is one of the strengths we have here at Essex. Um, various of us work on that. At the moment, we are not planning to run a Hegel module in 2021-22. Um, we are running the Kierkegaard module instead. Um, the modules we're running will allow you to um, bring in some post-Hegelian, post-German idealism, post-Kantian German idealism, sorry, in various forms. Uh, so for example, if you're really interested in Hegel, uh, for the Kierkegaard model, you, uh, module, you could um, work on Kierkegaard's criticism of Hegel and look at Hegel's, uh, Hegelian responses to that. Um, for the Frankfurt School, that draws on Hegel and Hegelian resources. So it's, it's there. But we won't run, uh, as things stand at the moment in 2021-22, a module directly on Hegel or the German idealist. The other thing is that many of us would be happy to supervise an MA dissertation on Hegel or German idealist more generally. Um, so Wayne Martin works on Fichte and Hegel, among others, Jörg Schaub and Timo Jutten and I work on Hegel. Um, there's interest in, in Schelling in the department. Uh, so yes, definitely but no direct module on Hegel in 2021-22. Um, so Matteo is asking about the application process for current Essex students. 
do you need a statement references? Uh, Joanna might be able to help me out here to answer this in uh, specifics. My understanding, I can tell you my understanding um, is the following. Um, existing students um, at Essex don't need a statement and a reference. They just can go via um, uh, my Essex to um, make an application. And because we hold already lots of information about you and your studies, and we know you already, I think these um, further things um, um, don't are not required. It's, it's as Joanna says in the chat, it's uh, you will be able to fill in a fast track application. Yeah. Um, I just need to go out of here to see. Peter is asking um, whether there's an opportunity to study Sartre doing the MA. Um, and the answer is sort of similar to um, what I said about Hegel. A number of us are interested in Sartre and work on Sartre, uh, among others, Irene McMullen. Um, but we are not putting on a module in 2021-22 on Sartre directly. Uh, but you're most welcome to bring it into um, the modules we do offer. So, for example, um, one could do an essay on uh, Kierkegaard and Sartre for the Kierkegaard module to, to stick with my example. And also for the MA dissertation, yeah, um, it would be well possible to be supervised on um, a project on Sartre. I mean, this is a general thing about postgraduate modules. Um, so you, with postgraduate modules, you normally set your own questions and um, module supervisors will be happy to give you quite a lot of leeway to um, identify your own topic and um, resources, advising you on that, but giving you leeway. Um, and that's especially true for the MA dissertation. So um, topics which might not be directly covered in the modules are things you can take up for the MA dissertation. Next is asking what's the typical uh, class size? So normally MA modules are really small groups. Um, we're talking about six to 10 in the typical class. Yeah. It's really um, at the MA level, the main idea is to really um, have seminars and seminar discussion and that for that it's really important to be in small groups and to have this really uh, direct uh, form of um, seminar discussion interaction. And Okay, any other questions or issues you want to raise? Anna is asking how supervisors are chosen in this or assigned. Um, so the way that works is that basically you decide on the topic you want to or at least a, an idea for a topic you want to write your dissertation on, your MA dissertation. And then you would email or in other ways approach um, existing staff members and um, see who would be willing to supervise you. So it's basically you would approach someone and then um, they would normally say yes and you might approach several people and then you, it was a matter of deciding who of those would be most suitable. Also, I, as MA director, um, would help you in that process. So it might be that we normally have a workshop about the MA dissertation in the autumn term, and people can tell me a little bit about the projects they're thinking about, and then I would point them in the direction of the most um, suitable staff member. So they're chosen by the student, but the supervisor has to agree to do the supervising. But unless they're on leave, or for other reasons, um, special reasons not available, they, they normally would be very happy to do so. Matteo is asking, what is the deadline for choosing a topic for a dissertation? So we try to build up to, um, the, the dissertation is a longer piece of research, about 10,000 words. 
and um, we try to build up to that. Um, so in the autumn term, there is a sort of workshop where I, as MA director, will talk you through a little bit um, some of the basics. And then you're invited by mid, by the middle of spring term, roughly speaking, by mid-March, um, to draft a sort of abstract, um, an outline of what you want to do. So that's where you choose your topic and uh, the title. And then with that outline and title, you would try to secure a supervisor and they would help you to refine that title and topic and abstract. And then you submit that and then I as MA director might also give you some feedback. And then the actual writing of a dissertation happens basically from May onwards, from May to mid September. And it's normal that whatever you've chosen as a topic and title by mid March might then as part of the actual work on the dissertation between May and mid September might be refined and changed. That's not a big deal. Um, that's completely what's to be expected of the process. But it's good to sort of start thinking about it basically by the middle of the spring term. I mean, if you have an idea already now, that's perfect too. I think a lot of people um, who know already what they want their dissertation on also think about which modules to choose. So, sort of, sort of, you know, to complement the different modules and the dissertation. So, for example, when I did my MA, um, I knew I wanted to do a PhD later on on Heidegger, uh, not on Heidegger, on Adorno. So I, I knew, however, that Adorno uh, was a big critic of Heidegger, and so that was important. So I choose a module on Heidegger. I knew that Heidegger, um, Adorno was very influenced by Hegel, so I did a module on Hegel. Um, I was interested in some of the contemporary debates and ethics to relate Adorno to contemporary issues, so I took a module in contemporary ethics and so on. But that's just one way of doing it. You can also um, choose modules just uh, sort of on an individual basis and not make it part of a grand plan. Uh, that's really up to you. And I, as a um, director, would be happy to advise you in these matters, but it's really um, the decision of you as a student. Okay, I think I answered any question which are at the moment, either in the chat or in the Q&A. Are there any questions, other, other questions you might have? Um, or does anyone want to perhaps share a little bit some, some of the topics they're interested in, um, some of the ideas they have which they would like to pursue? Okay. Okay, at the moment it seems like everybody has the fill when it comes to their questions um, and the information. That's, that's absolutely fine. If something pops to mind which you would like to talk about, just send me an email, please, to this address. Um, and also, I'm happy to, to advise on um, thinking about um, which, um, which um, modules you want to take or topics or and what might be super, suitable supervisors and also um, in terms of um, the process. But here, yes, um, where can you find the updated list of modules offered? Um, so at the moment, the list is as follows. There will be, just a second. There will be a module on environmental philosophy taught by Alisif. Um, and then, 
Fiona Hughes will teach a module on Kant. Um, Marie Guillaume will teach a philosophy of language by looking particularly at feminism and uh, questions about bullshit and other um, sort of uses of language which we might find problematic. Um, Dan will teach a module on Kierkegaard. Um, Lorna will teach a module on contemporary critical theory with a focus, I believe, on feminism. Jörg will teach a module on aesthetics and politics with questions around what sort of aesthetic freedom do we need for democracy. Um, and I will teach a module on the Frankfurt School by looking at the questions around um, philosophy of history and uh, whether there has been any moral progress and how we should think about that. Um, and Beatrice and Pyle will teach our MA writing workshop, um, which is an extracurricular module to help people uh, step up to um, MA level and PhD level work. Okay. Um, thank you very much for attending. And as I said, please drop me an email if you have any other questions. Um, take care and uh, hoping to see you next autumn here at Essex.